are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Jump into some of the questions and comments, and then uh, we'll just keep extending it right on along. But uh, yeah, there was one from Coach D back up here at the top that I wanted to get to. While you look huh. at the, while you look for that, I'll bring it all home with this: is that the problem with firing the manager, and we've said this before, is that the Reds would be admitting that their organizational alignment is incorrect. So really, that brings Nick Crawl into question. Nick Crawl can't fire David Bell without his own job becoming a, mm-hmm. a question mark. So that's why Nick Crawl is not going to fire David Bell. I think when we see changes, we will see that systemic change where David Bell moves to the front office other managerial stuff because Derek Johnson is firmly entrenched in this system. Um, Jeff Pickler, the, the scouting and advanced uh, scouting coach and infield coach is firmly entrenched in this system. They will have to do a big time overhaul. And I think that if any changes are made, they're made this off season with that, but I don't necessarily know that we see David Bell get fired. I think we'll see some changes made underneath David Bell before he gets let go. All right, this is from Coach D, and I'm going here, Jeff, only because I know you have an opinion on it because we talked about it before the show today. So Coach D says, if the future is next year, then why on earth did they draft another pitcher when we needed outfield help? Not drafting Condon is just mind-blowing. And I, I bring this up because you brought this up while yeah. we were doing our show notes earlier. So take it away. There's a couple of different reasons. Number one, I do not begrudge draft picks because for the most part, they are future needs. And yes, the Reds desperately need outfield help and they desperately need outfielders in their system, but they also need pitching all of the time. Consider for a moment what it's like for a free agent to come to Great American Ballpark. If you're a hitter, you can resurrect your career. Nick Castellanos did it. We've seen some other guys do it. Now we've seen some bad investments like Candelario and Mike Mastak. But for the most part, you are going to attract major league hitters here on free agent deals, and they're going to flourish in most cases. Pitchers don't want to come here. Sonny Gray was given the choice between St. Louis and Cincinnati. Knowing Cincinnati, he chose St. Louis. And I think that's that's something that we can ascribe to a lot of other pitchers. Frankie Montas came here because he was trying to resurrect his career. That's why they signed him. We haven't seen them go out and get a bona fide free agent pitcher as much as they need to. They have not been able to lure that kind of guy in. So you have to draft and develop pitchers and basically become a kind of pitching system, kind of like what the Cleveland Guardians are, what the Tampa Bay Rays are you're not going to lure in the big money free agents with them. So you're going to have to draft the high end talent, develop the high end talent, and then hopefully you can at least keep them here for an extended period of time, not just five or six years. And then you take and you trade and you sign hitting. And I think that's why I have no problem with the pick whatsoever. I, I still go back and I say like Charlie Condon would have been nice, but I understand why they went and they got chase Burns. And I don't think there's some people that are making out to be like the worst draft pick they've ever seen. And I think that's just silly. There's too much sensationalism in life. We don't need to sensationalize the MLB draft. This from Carlton Van Hoy. This is during our starting rotation conversation for 2025 yeah. he says i'm telling you brandon williamson will be a hard guy to keep out of the rotation uh, this is a good point because brandon williamson is working his way back right now i don't know if we're going to see him this year uh, maybe maybe mm-hmm. we'll see him for a start or two uh but carlton you're right in that he could compete for a rotation spot also i think he's the guy whose name you sub in for chase burns if chase burns isn't quite ready if the reds want to follow a similar route with Chase Burns that they did with Rhett Lauder, starting him at Dayton, seeing if he can mow down the competition and just fast promotions from there, then you're going to need another guy in the rotation. And Brandon Williamson probably is that guy. Um, I think Graham Ashcraft's days as a starting pitcher are over and he is going to be uh, in the bullpen for the Reds. I was going to say, let's do that. Three guys, one spot. You've got Brandon Williamson, Graham Ashcraft, Chase Burns, Who's in the opening day rotation? I think if all things being considered, I would put uh, Chase Burns at Dayton and let him kind of earn it like Rhett Lauder did. 
I would put Graham Ashcraft in this bullpen as a stopper. Um, you know, Graham Ashcraft is bulldog enough that he might be that back end of the bullpen guy we're looking for. Uh, if he can come out and pitch with maximum effort. And then uh, I, but that leaves Brendan Williamson, who I think probably goes into the rotation. And then you've got guys like uh, Julian Aguiar and you've got, Carson Spires, who can be down at Louisville, ready to go as your sixth and seventh starters if you need somebody to start a doubleheader or if somebody gets something tweaked along the way. I think I agree with you there. I can't can't much argue that. I, I, I just think that Graham Ashcraft is destined for the bullpen. I thought it was interesting that they said that he is not coming back the rest of this year. Partially, I think it's just because I think his injury was more substantial than they let on in the beginning. But at the same time, our thought process was they were saying – that he was hopefully working toward a rehab outing to come back. And our thought process was if he does come back, it's because they're moving him to the bullpen. So I think they're leaving the door open for him to be part of the starting rotation next year. But I think things will play out because of his pitch profile, because the fact that he does not do well, if he can't dial it back or if he has to dial it back, he, he doesn't do well. I think we see him in the bullpen moving forward. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's how it shakes out. I, and then again, when we talk about these things, when we talk about 2025, we're considering that everybody's healed, everybody's healthy, everybody is ready to go. Uh, we don't know that that's going to be the case. If only reality that's certainly, were that that's fun. <laughs> certainly what we're hoping for, right? Because yeah. John Park asks about the park. Says, should we consider expanding the ballpark outfield to make it a little harder and more pitcher friendly at Great American Ballpark? I, they would have to remove seats to push the wall back any further. They would have to do some structural changes, I think, in order to make the outfield any bigger. Could you raise it? Could you like raise the wall? Make a bigger wall, but you still would have yeah. to remove seats. Either way, you're going to, you're going you're yeah. to lose capacity. I don't know. I know they did this in Baltimore, um, but I don't necessarily know that that's the answer because you would have to fundamentally change some things like, they're backed up against the street back there. They don't have a lot of space to really back up and keep the number of seats that they have. And then, of course, there's going to be plenty of people that are just like, well, they don't need the seats that they have because people ain't showing up. Once they finally figure out that winning ball games draws fans, then there'll be people. Yeah, it, looked, but, it looked pretty bleak on TV last night, didn't it? Oh, Down at the I, old ball yard. And hey, I don't begrudge anybody. It's a million degrees outside right now. So I don't begrudge anybody that's like, dude, the weather sucks. This team's not playing all that great. Why am I coming down to watch them play the Oakland A's who aren't playing all that great? And worst case scenario, we get beat by a team that's trying for a draft pick more than they are trying to win. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't know that you're, you're changing the dimensions of the outfield to, to placate what you might think would help you get pitchers or what you might think would turn some wary fly balls into that were going to be home runs into outs. Jimmy McFarland says you can make the outfield, the center field wall taller. You could center field is really not the problem at GAB though. It's the, it's the lines. So much stuff just carries out down the left and right field lines that I, I don't know that there's a fix. And you know, that's just baseball and you yeah. know it. And you know, so you, you draft and grow your own pitchers. And the piece that's missing here is them going out and signing some big money guys to, to mash the baseball. The ball and, on the you know, there, I've been getting a lot of pushback on my outfield take, Jeff, of going out and getting not two, but three bona fides to play outfield and consider TJ Friedel your fourth outfielder. A lot of guys are mad at me. It's no disrespect to TJ Friedel, but I still don't know who he is. Is he yeah. the guy from two years ago that, showed he could play every single day and be in the lineup versus lefties or is he the guy that's going to be hurt all the time i don't know uh i don't want the reds to continue with this we hope he's going to be okay strategy and only sign two dudes go sign three and if tj friedel is the tj friedel that he was two years ago well then he competes for a job right and you need more than three outfielders anyway so for me, that's where the three outfielder take came from. I, I think they go and sign a big money free agent. Maybe they can trade for a guy. Maybe they go sign two free agents and trade for a guy, but they need to bring in outfield help around here and it needs to be a total overhaul of the outfield. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of, and, and this is just sports. This isn't even just Cincinnati, but you, there's guys you gravitate towards and TJ is an easy guy to gravitate toward personality wise and his style of play. But for a moment, just look at it, you know, analytically and objectively, his style of play 
means that he is an injury risk all the time. Is he injury time. prone? Do you feel like he's injury prone? I think I think he's an injury away. Is he Nick Senzel? No, he's not that bad. Um, Nick Senzel redefined what injury prone can be. Uh, I, I think that he's probably an injury away from being deemed injury prone, but he's definitely an injury risk more so than other guys. Every player has an injury risk, but because of his position and because of how he plays, he is at greater risk than other players are. And with that being said, you cannot count on that guy. That's the thing that we're talking about here. We're not saying that talent wise, he deserves to be the fourth outfielder. We're saying that when you look at this analytically and you really just take in the bigger picture, how can you bet on a guy that didn't even play half of a season this year? That's what we're talking yeah. about with this. Yeah, totally agree with that that last part there, Jeff, for sure. Uh, this from our buddy, Carrick Melvin. He says he left Ashcraft off his list of possible starters. Uh, he says, I would see how he does in spring before moving him to the pin. I think you're giving up on him too early. Uh, this, is a, this is interesting, Carrick, because I feel like I'm one of the few guys that hung in there on Graham Ashcraft this year. There were calls to move him to the bullpen from last year, and I thought, wait, that's way too fast. You can't do that yet. Uh, and then he came out and had the year that he had, and it's made me reconsider my stance on that. Sounds like maybe you're just hanging with him a little bit longer. I mean, if he comes into spring training and looks great and 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 can compete for the job, great. Um, but you're going to have to make a decision on him early. You're going to have to decide early what is he going to be. Is he going to be part of this bullpen, or is he going to compete for the rotation? Because if he's not going to be part of this bullpen, you have to go out and get a long man, and you have to go out and get somebody for the back end. You need you have both of those needs on this team, so yeah, I, I don't know. They're going to have to make a decision quickly. I don't know that you can wait halfway through spring training to decide if Graham Ashcraft is going to be in the bullpen or if he's going to be in the rotation. I think you have to go into camp already knowing what your intention is for Graham Ashcraft. So, uh, and if they're going to make that decision before spring training, I think the bullpen is the answer. Is it early? I think. I could be sold that it's a little early, but I also think that the Reds are in a position where they, they can't really wait anymore. We're, we're not in a develop and, and, and figure this out phase. And 2025 cannot be another year of that. They can't be another year of let's figure out what we got and move forward. 2025 needs to be, let's go get it here. And what I know about Graham Ashcraft in his 328 career innings is that he has just these wild swings where he will go six to eight to 10 starts where he's got an ERA of like two. And then he'll go six to eight to 10 starts where he's got an ERA of like 12. And, and that for me screams relief pitcher because you can't build that consistency. A, a starting pitcher needs to be able to dial it back, throw 85%, throw 80% and still be effective. And he can't do that. I know for a fact, watching him pitch is when he is going full bore, throwing hundred mile an hour cutters and all that great stuff. That's when he is most effective. Let's make sure he can do that every single time he's on the field. I, I, I think I'm firmly, I got both feet in the camp of moving him to the bullpen. All right, Jeff, I'm about to throw you a bone. You you've been waiting your whole life for this. Chris checks in and says the Reds need to bring in Soto. If he becomes a free agent, let's get the Joe Burrow effect and start using her to come play with Ellie and help us win championships. Go. <laughs> yes. The Reds need this. The Reds need Juan Soto. And, and quite frankly, they're not going to be at the top of the list as far as who is most like desirable for Juan Soto to come get, but consider this for a moment. Let's, let's take a walk here because the Cincinnati Reds have a lot of, of team control over the next few years. We still have this wonderful uh, diagram. And for anybody listening on audio at this point, I, I've thrown up this diagram of all the players that the Reds have under team control. Consider for a minute that the only guys they really have under arbitration the next year, you're adding Nicoladolo, you're adding Alexis Diaz, you have Jake Fraley, Jonathan Indy, and Tyler Stevenson. And, really and also it. you made this graphic before Jonathan India signed his two year deal. He's Jonathan right. India is signed next year already. We know what he has. So that being said, before any of the arbitration, which only is like four different players before any of those players hit arbitration, the reds are only spending like 50 million on their payroll for 2025. They have so much room to work with. You could go give Juan Soto $50 million a year. And you could still go get other pieces. 
And Juan Soto is probably going to garner about $50 million a year. And he loves Ellie. They both worked out in the off season together. I say there's two things that the Reds need. They need outfielders and they need a middle of the order hitter. Juan Soto is that guy. And they need to stop this whole thing where it's like, we've got team needs, but we're going to go get second tier players or retreads or prove it guys to fill those spots. The Reds are past that point. They need proven players. Juan Soto is an obvious proven player. He's the MVP. If there wasn't a guy named Aaron judge, or there wasn't a guy named Bobby Witt in the American league and the, the Yankees have still yet to commit to him. So I think he's going to hit that open market. Go get him. Here's the thing. And, and listen, it's not that I don't want Soto. I, yeah. Bring him to Cincinnati. I'll take it. But how much would the Reds have to overpay? How much extra would the Reds have to kick in to get him away from the Los Angeleses and the New Yorks and and the other big markets of the world? If if Soto simply drives across town and takes a deal with the Mets, he is going to be the big fish in the big pond, uh, the number one marquee name on his team, which I think is part of the problem in New York if, with him being for, with the Yankees. Mm-hmm. Why in the world would he come down the Ohio River and hang out in Cincinnati, Ohio? Why would he do that? I I just, the Reds would have to overpay so much in order to make that happen, I think. Uh, I mean, if, if, if all things being equal and it was just about dollars and the Mets and the Reds make an offer and the Reds is $10 million higher, then Soto becomes a member of the Reds, but it's more than that. It's the location. It's the market. It's the, the, the amount that Soto makes off of endorsement deals and other things that come along with being in New York or being in Los Angeles. It's not just what is the team willing to pay him? There are other considerations. I think this is an opportunity for baseball to go national because I think that baseball has regionalized itself far too much. Juan Soto can come to Cincinnati and still be promoted with endorsements. We're seeing Ellie getting the endorsement, like at least getting the MLB Mm -hmm. treatment. And I think he's going to continue to get that. We're going to see more and more stuff with Ellie in it after the season Mm -hmm. that he has had. But Juan Soto strikes me as a guy that doesn't need the limelight. He's played in Washington. He's played in San Diego. And as much as those teams tend to spend more money than the Reds do, those team, well, Washington's in a bigger market, but they're kind of hamstrung by Baltimore in a lot of different ways. But San Diego is not a big market team. He could be, I, I think as long as the money is right, I think he comes to Cincinnati. The only thing is going to be is does this ownership group care enough to invest in a guy like that? And that is a question that we can't answer because quite frankly, I think we know the answer and we don't want to say it. But I really think that this could happen because all you got to do is write the right dollar sign on there. I don't think he needs all the media attention, but he could get a lot of like really positive media attention in Cincinnati because we know how much they protect their players as opposed to, you know, the New York media that just absolutely lambastes people. All right. This from snow beast in regards to TJ Friedel being injury prone. He says anyone in center field is an injury risk. Jeffrey, so my question to you is, why do you want Ellie De La Cruz hurt? Because <laughs> I think that he is otherworldly. I think his athleticism and his ability to be, I mean, think of like how he looks right now and what he does. He already does the injury risk thing, steals a lot of bases, takes the extra base as many times as he possibly can, slides head first most of those times. And so far he's been okay. And, and I don't think that that means that he is like, uh, invulnerable, but I also think that he has put himself into injury risk situations and shown himself to be a lot more stronger than the people that we typically worry about with that style of play. Ellie De La Cruz should never leave the infield. I believe the best version of Ellie De La Cruz is Ellie De La Cruz Cincinnati Reds starting third baseman. I ultimately think that's where he's going to end up. I just, and I don't know. And how can you be team Ellie to center field, but also go off as hard as you do about being so tired of the Reds playing infielders in the outfield? Like, how can you have both? You know why? 
You know why? Because Ellie could play all nine positions in a single game. He could be the only fielder in the field, and I still think the Reds have a better defense than putting oh Spencer Steer out there. He is God. a he is a better athlete than anyone. I think he he might be the level of athlete that we talked about with like Eric Davis, obviously, because he always gets compared to that because the number 44, but he might be right there on the same level with every single person you can name as the best athlete that the Reds have ever had. Ellie's right there on that same level. He, he could play any position. And that's the thing for me is that I know that there are a lot of people that disagree with my take that he could be a good center fielder, but here's the thing. I don't disagree with your take because you can put Ellie at any position and he will be the best player at that position within one year. I believe that any position. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. The Reds are going to have to make a decision sooner than later uh, about what they're going to do with Ellie long term. Uh, this from Jimmy McFarlane. I believe he's talking about the remainder of this year. He let Hines get a bulk of the playing time. What would you what would you need to see from Reese Hines the rest of the way in order for you to be willing to consider him in the outfield equation for 2025 versus the Reds going out and getting another guy? Is there anything he could do over the last five weeks that would make you say the Reds don't need to go get another guy? No, but yeah, I'll say I this. I, I, I think that I think that he can play his way into being the fourth outfielder. There's a realm. I don't think that there's a realm of reality where the Reds do what we want them to do and go get three outfielders, but I think they can get two and you count TJ Friedel as your third, and then maybe Reese Hines becomes your fourth. It really sounds like, and, and I say this knowing that Stuart Fairchild is still a Cincinnati Red, I there's really, I, I think that there's a lot more to this thumb injury that, that Stuart Fairchild is getting, his sur getting surgery on now that I don't know that we see Stuart Fairchild for a very long time. Maybe we see him at some point next year, but I don't know that I'm counting on him because I've never heard of anybody having UCL trouble in their thumb and whatever this is, it sounds like new territory. So I think that we almost have to write Stuart Fairchild out of the plans because of this injury. So the fourth outfield spot could be up for grabs and Reese Hines could show himself to be in that. The biggest problem is Reese Hines where everybody wanted to compare Ellie De La Cruz to Aristides Aquino. Ellie has proven that that's not the case. Reese Hines is kind of in that territory where it's like all the pitcher has to do is not throw him a fastball and he is at a disadvantage. He's got to prove that on a consistent everyday basis, breaking balls and off-speed pitches are not his kryptonite because right now it seems like they are. Jimmy McFarlane asks, didn't McLean play outfield in college? Why? Yes, he did. He played outfield for UCLA. Um, if you're going to move somebody off the infield, that probably makes more sense than using the one of the faces of baseball to crash into walls in the outfield, Jeffrey. But um, I don't see either one of those guys moving to the outfield, really, if we're being realistic. I uh, I need to see Matt McClain on the field before I consider where he plays on the field. Right. You recently called him injury prone on a show that's going to air later this week on uh, one of our friends' podcasts. Um I, I don't know that that's fair assessment of Matt McLean, but um, I, I you're right. That, he does need to get on the field. I think that it, it's a stretch to say that I said that he's injury prone, but I don't think that he's health prone. I'm a little bit worried <laughs> about, about what his future holds. All right. Uh, Kerry brings up a great point that we didn't discuss when we were talking about Soto and that's that Ellie and Soto are buddies. They in fact work out together in the mm -hmm. off season. So I mean, maybe that's a, a extra point for Cincinnati if they were willing to throw the kind of money around that it's going to take to get Soto. Look, I, th I think that the NBA really increased its brand when you had players being like, I'm bringing my friends in and we're going to create this like super team. Now, I'm not saying that just Juan Soto and Ellie make a super team. We saw that in Los Angeles with Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. But the 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 major league marketing department could play up some different types of like buddy baseball. And this would be a perfect thing to do. I, I would love all of the different marketing things that they could come up with, with Juan Soto and Ellie De La Cruz. I mean, we saw early on in the season, Ellie's really kind of dropped this uh, as the season has gone along, but we saw early on in the season, whenever Ellie would take a pitch, he would do like his own little modified version of the Soto shuffle. 
And while it looked a little bit like uh, Mike Gesicki trying to hit the gritty, I still loved what I saw from it, and I would love to see them two on the same team. I, I still think that there's too many factors that probably kill my dream of this, but I am going to stand on a table this offseason and say, go get Juan Soto until Juan Soto is wearing a different uniform. So Coach D brings up a great point about why we may not see a lot of, of big, long-term contracts. I, the, the Shohei Otani contract was an aberration for a lot of reasons, but um, Coach D says Major League Baseball needs a salary cap. Do what the NFL does. That's why it's heads and shoulders above uh, all the other major sports because every team has a chance to win if they draft correctly. So if you were a player in Major League Baseball right now, if, if you saw the contract that Shohei Otani just got, if you see the contracts that guys like Manny Machado got and guys like Soto are going to get, would you agree to a salary cap? Of course you would not agree to a salary cap. Um, baseball does need a salary cap. Uh, there needs to be an economic overhaul of the sport. It's coming. It's coming at the end of the next collective bargaining agreement. But just understand what we're asking for when we ask for that. We're asking for baseball to shut down for at least a year. It's the only way it's going to get done. There is a work stoppage coming. It's going to be a significant work stoppage. Uh, I anticipate Major League Baseball losing an entire season when they really get into the nuts and bolts of this. It's going to be ugly. Um, but you're not wrong, coach. There needs yeah, to be an think, overhaul, but it's going to be ugly getting there. I, I agree with coach. Um I think that with it, they definitely need a salary floor so that you kind of have a little bit of the best of the both worlds. Like you must spend a certain amount, uh, which will, will take teams. Well, the, and like the NFL the kind of does that, right? The, the NFL yeah, has yeah, those yeah, yeah, things yeah, 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 yeah. built in. Yeah. You have this much on your rookie deals. It's all structured. You know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, teams aren't, you know, don't get me wrong. These owners are still making money in the national football league, but it is definitely controlled to a point where you got the players to agree to it. So but yeah, that you're right. That's got to be a piece of it. But we're entrenched now in, I mean, what, fi free agency is like 50, 60 years old, and they haven't done this yet. And I think that there's a big reason for that is that all parties involved have to understand that they are going to lose a year of business. And that's kind of the hard part with this is that not only, I mean, the players will definitely be fine with, with a work stoppage for an entire year, at least the, the high end players will be, but the owners kind of have to understand that too. And, and it's not about like what the pushback's going to be. It's going to be about the support for this. And this is like the one thing that I'm on the side that, yeah, if the owners are going to fight for it, I really want to see a salary cap. Cause I think that's really what brings the league to a level of parity that we see in the NFL. <laughs> There's a, some great back and forth over Ellie in center field happening. Uh, many comparisons to O'Neill Cruz. And I want to get into that for a second, but uh, he's better than Snow B Cruz. says that Jeff's going to move Ellie to catcher by the end of this episode. You're probably right. Um, he's got the arm, baby. He can throw it anywhere. He can throw out a runner. And John says Ellie would tear down the center field wall. That's also a distinct possibility. He wouldn't have um, to jump very high to rob a home run. I, but I want to talk about this because there's been a lot of comparisons about the Pirates moving O'Neill Cruz to the outfield and your take on the Reds moving Ellie De La Cruz to the outfield. Uh, O'Neill Cruz is nowhere near the defender that Ellie De La Cruz is. O'Neill Cruz no. is also, I don't think, exactly right post that ankle injury. Um, he has mm. not looked like the yeah. same guy since he came back. Um, I think the Pirates are struggling to find a lane for O'Neill Cruz right now, um, whereas Ellie is just – on continuing his uptick. He he's, he's, he's fine. Um, the pirates, I think are trying to cover some deficiency for O'Neill right now and trying to find a spot where they can put him and that he'll have some success. Uh, Ellie's a much better defender. And I, I think that moving Ellie to Jeff, you're not wrong in that Ellie would play a good center field. I'm not saying that he would not play a good center field. I also know how Ellie would play center field. He would play center field TJ Friedel style and he would be hurt. He would be laying out for balls. He would be calling off the left fielder on the left field line, trying to catch the ball. <laughs> you know, it would, it would be a thing. Um, I don't want, like, I don't want Ellie out there. Um, and it's not because I don't think he can play the position. I think he'll play the position at 110%. He'll play it really, really well. And he'll break things stadium and himself. So I want Ellie on the infield. Um, but, but I don't, I don't like these comparisons with O'Neill Cruz because they're just two dr drastically different players at this point. 
I was reminded by our friend Ethan Smith over at Locked On Pirates, there is a very, very big difference between O'Neill Cruz and L.A. De La Cruz. It's that O'Neill Cruz is about to be 26 years old. So the Pirates are kind of getting to the point where they have to figure out exactly how to best utilize him because they're running out of time with him. The Reds clock just started with Ellie. Wolfpack agrees with me. Long-term Ellie at third base. I, I am too, Wolfpack. I, that that's, arm. That that's arm really where third. I see him. It's He's going to so, be making some Arenado plays oh my God. at third. Oh, absolutely. Arm. Unquestionable. Some Kerry agrees Arnold. with you. Perry says that McLean is injury prone. I don't like this narrative, Jeff. I don't I like just, it. I don't think and, it's and, fair. And, the guy was got hurt doing a drill. I mean, come on. But that's 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 what leads me to believe injury prone is a possibility. I'm not saying he is, but he's definitely on track to be because he lost the rest of his season last year to an oblique injury, which is a, an injury that likes to rear its ugly head at different times throughout the rest of his career. And then he's got this, this labrum surgery that now he has to rebuild his arm. We'll see what his arm looks like. We'll see what his hitting looks like. I'm just a little bit worried about what post injury McLean and that, is going to be. And that's the biggest reason why I think you don't move him off of second base. Oh yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. This next year, you know, the, the question about him into the outfield. Um, yeah, I don't not with that him. shoulder reconstruction. Yeah. Um, I want to move McLean of... from the injured list to the field. That's the move right. I want to see. I, I hear you. There's, there's a lot of talk in the chat right now about Santander in the off season. And would that be mm -hmm. enough of a needle mover for you? Is that yes. the kind of sign would, would that signing? Is that a, is that a press conference worthy yes. signing in your yes. mind? It is I, me, because, but... because Santander is going to play, I think he'll play corner outfield because um, I've gotten some pushback from some everydayers about my Brent Rooker take and that they think that Brent Rooker is a DH first and an outfielder in emergency cases. Um, Santander is a better fielder than Brent Rooker, not as good as Juan Soto, but Santander would be a great uh, cleanup hitter for this team. And I think that that for me, if, if I'm power ranking what the Reds need most, it's a cleanup hitter. And, and, or at least somebody who hits third and then you move Tyler Stevenson to the fourth spot because the middle of this order only has half of what it needs. You need a good third and you need a good fourth. The Reds have one. They don't have the other because they've put steer in fourth. He hasn't, he's been inconsistent. And I would love to say that I think he's going to be more of what we've seen in the second half of the season than in the first half, but I don't want to bet on that just yet. CES don't know what he is. Got to see what he's going to be after this whole wrist broken ligament not wrist whatever it is thing um i just in my mind i think ces suffered the kind of injury like where harry potter like lost all of the bones in his arm and now he's just got to regrow bones in his arm like i think maybe that's what ces is going through here so hopefully we see the ces that we wanted to see but i'm not betting on that i can bet on a guy like anthony santander so if they don't get Juan soto then yes i want anthony santander Let's sign both. Why not? Go get them both. Go I mean, you can. Look, look, there's no salary cap in baseball. The only salary cap that is imposed on the Reds is the inability of the ownership group to spend. If they stopped doing that, boy, we could have some fun. That's a lot of cabbage. Hey, Carrick checked in during our, our baseball shutdown conversation. Wonders if the minor leagues would shut down next time there's a strike. I believe so, right? It's all the same. They're unionized. Now. They're yeah, all they're unionized. unionized. I, leagues, you couldn't yeah. use minor leaguers as scabs. I don't think, I think that there would be, um, you know, Jeff is willing to play, but other than that, I, it would be a <laughs> total baseball shutdown for a year in order to overhaul the economics of the look, sport. the, the supply and the variety and the quality of sunflower seeds in the dugout would just be unmatched if I were <laughs> on the field. The Robo Buck asks, is going to be lots of celebration next season with the 50th anniversary of the 75 World Series and the 35th anniversary of the 90s World Series? Probably so. And I mean, and let's, let's, this is kind of something we haven't talked about in a long time. The 75 guys, the 1990 guys, um, the 50th anniversary of the 1975 World Series, this, this could be one of the real last opportunities to honor yeah. that team. That's true with the team members around uh you know we've already lost joe morgan um you know these guys they're not getting any younger i would love to see the reds go all in on a season long of honoring 
the 50th anniversary of the 1975 World Series. Would love that, to see that. That would be fantastic because I think they did such a good job with the 150th season. I really mm -hmm. want to see them because, all right, as much as we we love to belabor, you know, what the Reds are going to put together as far as a on-field product and stuff like this, they do a fantastic job of celebrating their team history, and I, I think we'll see we'll see a lot of fun stuff. I, I I agree with you though. They have to, they definitely have to get this together because, um, you know, the, the 55th and the 60th might look a lot different than what the 50th could be. Let's do two more Jeff. And then we'll go ahead and call it a day. Cause we're going to be back in your feeds tomorrow after what well, God help us. If the reds don't win tonight while I'm down there. Um, the hey, I'm going, Hey, I'm at the ballpark tonight, guys. If you're around, come say hi. I'm sticking around for the Thomas Rhett concert. I imagine the ballpark is going to be packed. Um, maybe one of the last sellouts of the year. I'm really looking forward to being down there and uh, and hanging out with you guys. So definitely, if you see me, come say hi. Um, I want to talk to all of you. I love being down at the ballpark, even though it's going to be a hundred damn degrees down there. You're going to be you're going to be there today, and we're both going to be there for both legs of the doubleheader on Friday. So yeah, it's going to be fun time down at the ballpark. Um, it's gonna be hot. It's gonna be hot, Jeff. Yeah, It'll be very, very hot. Gonna need our, to gonna need our liquid IV. I'm gonna, gonna need, need a liquid IV because I tell you what, I, I definitely stepped off the airplane yesterday and was missing my trade winds from back home. It was hot in Columbus. <laughs> I'm talking hot. Okay, Coach D's asking, how do I find out your schedule for when you guys go live? So during the season, Coach, we go live on a whim. I'm sorry, that's just kind of the way it is. We try to work it out a day or two ahead of time, but. It just is the way it goes. During the off season, we try to go live every Friday. We do Aloha every Fridays live. Time. We throw on our Aloha shirts, and it's a live show on Fridays during the off season. So that's kind of the best schedule I can give you. Yeah. Because I was looking at, I think our our last live was directly after the trade deadline. So it's been a few weeks since we went live. Um, this from Travis. Do we still believe TJ Antone will ever be back? God, I, for him, I, I'm really torn on this Jeff because mm -hmm. for him, because I know how bad he wants it. I want him to be able to work his way back and I want him to pitch in the big leagues again. But you've heard me say lots of times that somewhere along the way, this, the medical staff and the coaching staff have an obligation to protect players from themselves. And I just don't know how many more times do you want to risk TJ Antone having to have his elbow rebuilt? Um, you know, we're three times now. He's, I, I, he's, I, attempting, I just, he's attempting to do something that I think only like three other pitchers have done. And the most recent pitcher was Johnny Venters, who after his third Tommy John surgery missed like multiple years. It wasn't just mm -hmm. one year, it was multiple years because he suffered other different injuries during his rehab. So I, I, I will say that I think that he'll do it because it sounds like he is super resolute in the fact that he wants to do it. And athletes have a, have a just different, any athlete in any sport, just about has a different sense of go get them than I can ever relate to. So I'm not going to doubt that he will be back at some point, but I don't know when that's going to be, and I don't know how good that's going to be. Or We're not talking about the TJ Antone that we saw for a little bit there a couple of years ago. I, we're going to hopefully see a guy that can be like a middle relief guy on this team, but I don't know that I want to put too that's many the, expectations on it. And that's the thing, because unless he's willing to come back and not pitch with maximum spin and maximum effort yeah. and throw, I, I mean, and if he doesn't pitch that way, is he a big league pitcher? We don't know. I, I just, I don't know. I, I, for TJ Antone, because I know that's what he wants. We've heard him talk about it. I hope he makes it, but yeah. I, I just don't know. I don't think with any reasonable expectation, you can expect for it to happen. You can't count on him to be part of this bullpen. You can't count on him to be anything of use at the major league level. And then if it does happen, then yay, that's, that's icing on a cake. That's bonus. That's a bonus reliever. Um, but you definitely can't plan on it. I, I just, it would be unrealistic to do that. I would love to sit here though and say, yes, he is back. So yeah. I'm hoping for that. I'm hoping for that. 
All right, Jeff, I think that is a good spot. We're an hour and 10 minutes here. I think that's a good place to go ahead and wrap it up for today. Uh, we'll be back in your feeds tomorrow post uh, Thomas Rhett. I'm heading out to Jeff's place, and we're going to record together. We'll be in the same room. Uh, going to record after the concert, and we'll be talking about this Oakland series and get you set for Rhett Louder Day as the Reds have a doubleheader on Friday. Rhett Louder going in game two of that series. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that, get to witness another debut down at Great American Ballpark. I'm super excited. Uh, Jeff, go ahead and get us out of here, my friend. Thanks to everybody who's in the comments section. You guys made it a great show with us. Always appreciate you joining us for some Reds talk. Make sure that you're subscribed. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And we've even got the Lockdown Reds insiders that you can check out if you text INSIDER to 513-597-0944. Then we will talk Reds all the time, texting back and forth about it. Uh, for A uh, free 14-day trial, four ninety nine dollars a month after those 14 days. Again, that's text the word insider to 513-597-0944. But for Steve and myself, you can always trust that we will be locked on Reds every single day. You're going to get a phone call from Matt McClain calling him injury prone. Get on the field. Prove me wrong. <laughs>